On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including the SpaceX Booster 7 damaged in testing, a Starship factory getting built in South Texas, Rocket Lab's first Hawkeye 360 satellite launch from Virginia, Chinese startup Deep Blue Aerospace gets funding for their reusable rockets, and the American government's plan to nuke the moon. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. We're seeing the early results from SpaceX stress testing their Booster 7 prototype, and they are pretty interesting. Some photos originating from a SpaceX employee and circulating through Discord show a pretty roughed up interior of the Booster 7 tank. The damage came from last week's testing, which subjected B7 to pressure and cryogenic proofing. Obviously, it didn't take the strain as well as it looked from the outside. But before any of us get too sad, we should remember a couple of things. First off, this is literally what testing is for. Booster 7 was the first of its type built to mount the new Raptor 2 engines, so SpaceX really needed to put that new design through its paces to see where the structural faults might be. This isn't a really good or bad result, it's just something that needed to be checked. Second, Booster 8 stacking is already underway. Its liquid oxygen storage tank and aft section were loaded last week. Add to that, there were pieces of Booster 9 spotted coming together, so there are at least two more launch candidates in the works. And finally, let's not forget that the real limiting factor to achieving an orbital flight test in May, like Elon predicted, is the FAA's environmental assessment of the new pad. Until then, SpaceX has nothing but time to test. Keeping on the SpaceX theme for just a bit longer, we've got pictures of the new Starship factory being built in South Texas. Currently, Starbase's production facility has been housed in these big tents. They call them sprung structures, and they seem to be working pretty well so far. But come on, this is an Elon Musk company, and there is no way they weren't going to build a really big factory at some point. And so it's not surprising that we're starting to see big steel beams and columns being erected on the foundations that were set up years ago. Structure work for big steel buildings tends to go up fast, and so we already have a vague idea of the shape, but some documents for a similar facility proposed in Florida give us a better idea of the overall size. According to Tesla Roddy reports, SpaceX aims to replace all of Starbase's tents with a single 300,000 square foot building that will be about 60 feet tall and likely measure around 800 feet long and 400 feet wide. Starbase's tents are roughly the same height, but their tented roofs mean that only a fraction of that height can be used for ring work and only a fraction of the floor space for taller nose work. Now, the current structure seems to be a bit shorter than the proposed 18 meters, which could mean the production facility will be restricted to working on just the standard five-ringed Starship designs instead of any special ones with more sections. But it's still too early to tell if they're going to be adding another floor above the current structure or not. So we will keep our eyes open for that and let you know. And that brings us back to SpaceX making their own version of NASA's famous vehicle assembly building just for Starship production, which follows with the other major work being done on Starship infrastructure. We're pretty excited to see what kind of production equipment and procedures this new facility will use. How fast do you think SpaceX will be able to stack new Starship vehicles when this monster is done? Let us know in the comments below. China is really starting to get into the commercial space race. Deep Blue Aerospace, one of the many Chinese launch startups, has just reported that they've secured another round of funding that will allow them to further develop the reusable Nebula 1 rocket, their Thunder engines, and the additive manufacturing process for both. Last year, Deep Blue was able to launch 10 and 100 meter vertical takeoff and landing tests, and they're now working towards a kilometer high test with their Nebula M rocket and a 20 ton thrust Thunder 20 engine. That's very cool news. More folks getting into not just rockets, but reusable rockets is only going to make for better tech down the road. But it's not just Deep Blue Aerospace that's getting the financial nod. Over 37 rocket startups got funded last year, and things seem to be increasing in 2022. 
The company Landscape, for instance, is currently getting ready for China's first privately funded liquid-fueled rocket launch attempt. Beijing is busy getting their Dashin district ready as an industrial hub for commercial aerospace, and the city of Guangzhou is setting up a large industrial base project in their Nansha district to help aid space production. So clearly, things are heating up in China. Startup company Rocket Lab has signed a deal to carry out their first Virginia-based launch for Hawkeye 360, taking the company's satellite into space. On April 19th, Rocket Lab announced they had signed a contract to carry 15 satellites over three separate launches later this year from the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. Two will be dedicated satellite launches, each with six satellites aboard, while the final launch will carry the remaining three satellites and some other customers into space. Rocket Lab has been very busy trying to get their Electron rocket approved for a very important feature called Autonomous Flight Termination System software, and has also been expanding the reusability of Electron, hoping to catch the next rocket launch from their home in New Zealand with a helicopter. In a press release, Rocket Lab set a date for their first U.S. launch, saying, Encouraged by NASA's recent progress in certifying its autonomous flight termination unit software, which is required to enable electron launches from Virginia. Rocket Lab has scheduled the mission from Launch Complex 2 no earlier than December 2022. Rocket Lab seems to be growing at a very quick pace. They even announced a new rocket type, the Neutron, which will be built and flown entirely from the Wallops Flight Facility. The Neutron is going to be Rocket Lab's mega constellation launcher and is designed to land under thrust like the Falcon 9. But first, all eyes are on the Electron and the first catch attempt of the booster in a mission titled There and Back Again, which should be happening before the end of April. Okay, we're not going to sugarcoat it. Our last story this week is a bit weird. It's got secretive government agencies, eccentric billionaire researchers, technology that could come from a sci-fi novel, and UFOs. Over 1,600 pages of documentation has been released based on a Freedom of Information Act request filed over four years ago. The pages document the American Defense Intelligence Agency and their Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, something UFO researchers have been trying to get a peek at for years now, and it seems they had good reason. Not only does it look like the DIA were indeed looking into UFO phenomena, they were also running something called the Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Application Program. This weapons program often overlapped with research being done in the Threat Identification Program. So we have two mostly interchangeable government programs studying weird phenomena, but what is the report actually about? Well, it does involve nuking the moon. No, really. There was a plan to blow a hole through the moon using nuclear explosions. This sort of plan was just one of many that revolved around research into the speculative application of tech from all our favorite science fiction. Invisibility cloaking, stable wormholes for travel, stargates, negative energy, anti-gravity, high-frequency gravitational wave communications, and, of course, the nuking a hole in the moon plan. Now, as far as we know, none of these technologies got close to being usable, but the interesting part is that the research for this program is mostly being handled by outside contractors, specifically Bigelow Airspace Advanced Studies. If you're not familiar, this company is owned by Robert Bigelow, who is a well-known UFO enthusiast and even owns the infamous Skinwalker Ranch, a site with extremely high levels of paranormal activity and UFO sightings. Apparently, Bigelow is a friend of Senator Harry Reid, the guy responsible for setting up this program in the first place. Bigelow reportedly lobbied for the creation of the program itself, which is probably the reason his company did most of the research. This is obviously where things really start to look not so good. It's one thing to open a secret study into sci-fi weaponry and tech, but it's another to have a billionaire whose hobbies include UFO research ask his senator friend to start a program and give him $10 million in contracts to mess around with moon nukes. This is where the Freedom of Information Act comes from. Obviously, it's really hard to keep stuff like this secret. So a physicist working for Bigelow leaked the project list to a guy named George Knapp, who then started spreading the info around. After that, it was just a matter of time before Stephen Aftergood, director of the Federation of American Scientists Project on Government Secrecy, filed the Freedom of Information Act request. 
For his part, though, it seems that Senator Reid is happy with the success of the program, writing, Ultimately, the results of AATIP will not only benefit the U.S. government, but I believe it will directly benefit DOD in ways not yet imagined. The technological insight and capability gained will provide the U.S. with a distinct advantage over any foreign threats and allow the U.S. to maintain its preeminence as a world leader. It seems like Reid is suddenly very interested in showing off how useful the program is, and with more information requests undoubtedly on the way, we may not have to wait long to hear if they actually got a Stargate to work, though I highly doubt it. Stay tuned, folks. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.